Well, here we are in Wilkesdale again on the 18th of March, this time, 2013. I'm joined by Mary. Welcome, darling. Thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to continue a Paget Measures discussion today on uh, that we were working on last time that we got mm -hmm. together, and that was on the one by Joseph Salyards, and he's talking about laws of the spirit world. So this is the second part. And this message is on the 3rd of May, 1915. That's when it was given. So I thought what we'd do is just proceed straight into reading about each law and then discussing it, uh, discussing it together. And there's basically four laws that are, that are looked at in this section, but one of the laws is not specifically mentioned. So yeah. we'll, we'll discuss the, the four laws as we go through. Mm -hmm. And perhaps what we'll do this time is read the entirety about each law sure, sure. before we proceed with our discussion. So I'll start. Mm -hmm. I'm here, Professor Salyarts. Yes, and I'm very much pleased that you have and that you are in such good condition to write tonight. Well, I desire to continue my discourse on the laws of the spirit world as known to many spirits. The next law is that no matter how much knowledge of material things and of purely physical laws a man may have acquired on earth, his knowledge is not sufficient to fit him for the higher things of the spirit life. Many men think that because they have this great knowledge of the material universe, they need not attempt to learn the laws which control the operations of spirit life or the laws which determine the position and development of that part of man commonly known as the soul. This is a very great mistake, and all human beings sooner or later will realise the necessity of learning these more important laws of, of the soul development and of the spiritual part of man. I never, while on earth, attempted to investigate these laws, and consequently, when I came into the spirit world, I was as a newborn babe in my understanding of these laws. And so will all humans be who have neglected the investigation and study of these laws as I did. I would therefore advise every man to give his best endeavour to study to the study of these laws, and especially that part of them which deals more particularly with the soul's development and progress towards the greatest happiness. These laws are set forth and declared to a very large extent in the New Testament and in some parts of the Old are many suggestions as to what a man should do to save his soul from death. And by this I mean the death that comes with neglecting to exercise all of the qualities of, of the soul that a man is capable of exercising when in the mortal life. A man may let his faculties of mind die by neglecting to feed them the proper mental food and so with the soul. Of course, the soul never dies as far as known in the sense of absolute destruction and disintegration, but it can get into such a state of inertia or lethargy that so far as it, as it is a part of the activities of man, it may as well be dead. <laughs> I don't mean to say that the mere neglect to exercise these soul faculties will cause a man's soul to remain dead forever, for that is not so. Sooner or later, either in the mortal life or in the spirit life, this soul will have an awakening. But that awakening may be delayed for many years and even centuries, and in its highest sense, it may never have an awakening. So let men know the importance of studying and applying these spiritual laws to their own selves while mortals. And when they come to be spirits, they will find what a great advantage to their progression and happiness such study and application have proved to be. So that's the first law. The, basically, it's the law that it doesn't matter how much you study about the material universe. And just because you've studied and well learned about the material universe, it means nothing when it, apply, when it comes to the spirit world. Yeah, it sort of speaks to this idea, doesn't it, that there's higher laws that supersede other laws. Mm. So the material laws, we can know as much as we can, but as soon as um, as soon as we enter the spirit realm, there's a whole other set of laws that are operating, that are all operating while we're here as well. Yes. And that's why he's encouraging us to, to know them. Yes. While we're here. I feel one of the biggest problems that he's sort of exposing here is most people when they're on earth have no desire whatsoever to know about their future life. In fact, and that's driven a lot by fear actually, mm. because they're so afraid of dying and death 
They're so afraid that you don't really know what happens after death. And many people believe that once you're dead, you are dead and gone. And so because of all these deep fears they have, they have no desire whatsoever to understand the laws that govern the soul and the spirit body. They only look at the laws that govern the physical side of life. Yeah. And of course, the physical laws, while there are, they are numerous, um, they have very little bearing on where the position of the soul will end up and where the position of the spirit will end up once they've passed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's sort of encouraging people to say, and, and it's a bit like the illustration I gave in, uh, that, that's recorded in the Bible about the rich man and Lazarus. You know, the rich man ignored all of his development while on earth in love. And then when he passed, he realised the big mistake, but he's already passed then. Yeah. And then, and then he, wanted, he wanted somebody to send somebody back to his, to his friends and family and brothers on earth, uh, educating them about the changes. But unfortunately, most people while they're on earth don't have any desire to <laughs> learn about yeah. the changes that happen in the spirit world once you've passed and, and also how things are restricted and governed in the spirit world as compared to here. Yeah. So here we have this unfettered and unrestricted usage of our will and many people as a result of this unfettered and unrestricted part of the will decide that they only want to use their will to examine the physical and even then they don't really examine it, they just live in it without much knowledge of what's really going on. Or uh, reflection really. Or reflection, or reflection of the pain in their own body and yeah. why are they growing old and why are they getting sick and why, you know, why, yeah. why do these bad things happen on the planet? There's very little contemplation of those particular things by the majority. But if we did contemplate these things, we'd be able to actually, we'd be able to cure all these things on the planet and also prepare ourselves ironically for the life in the spirit world as well. Yeah. 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 Can we talk about one uh, specific sentence about halfway down that page mm -hmm. um, where Salyads is saying, these laws are, laws are set forth and declared to a very large extent in the New and Old Testaments or some parts in the Old. But um, he talks about to how we should save our soul from death. He says... It's a death that comes from neglecting to exercise all the qualities of the soul that a man is capable of exercising. Mm. And I wanted to ask you to talk about what are these qualities of the soul? Well, let's talk firstly, I think, about what is meant by the death of the soul. Mm. Because the soul really remains dead in its highest sense while we neglect to receive divine love or while we neglect to develop a desire to receive divine love from God. Because it's the divine love, we've been given the potentiality since my arrival in the first century, the potentiality of receiving this love and therefore experiencing the resurrection, if you like, of the soul. Yes. Um, but, but for the majority of people, what they finish up choosing to do is they neglect the development of the soul in its highest sense. In other words, in the sense of the ability to experience the new birth and, and go through the development of the soul in terms of receiving divine love. Now, those things, though the ability to receive divine love from God, were explained in the Bible to a certain degree. You mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of changes that occurred in the Bible over the last 2,000 years that have meant that a lot of it got written out of the Bible because they didn't really understand what was meant by the new birth or what was meant by receiving divine love into the soul and trans the transformation that occurs afterwards. And so, and so what happened was that religion began to focus primarily on the moral aspects of the soul, yeah. which is still a development of the soul, mm -hmm. but it's only a development of, a, of, the, of the, the natural love, the, the spiritual part of the soul, rather than the soul itself and its full potential. So, so when he's referring here to the death of the soul, he's really referring to the, de the death of the soul in its purest sense, is, is not the actual physical death of a soul, but rather the death of the potentiality of the soul's full development. And that is dependent upon our will. We can choose to have the potential of our full development or we can choose to reject the potential of our full development. And, and in amongst that is also moral development and, mm -hmm. and other parts of the development that must be also accomplished through this process. But, uh, but which would naturally be accomplished if we receive divine love, but 
but also which we must endeavour to accomplish if we don't receive divine love. Yep. That's the only way to progress. Yeah, so this is what he's talking about later on where he says um, that... Um, that we may not have the awakening even for centuries uh, and in the highest sense it may never have the awakening which is really about opening to God. To and, God, yeah. 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 And do you think that um, these, other, these other qualities of the soul, is that, is that really just discovering, you talked about discovering our will and developing morally and developing mm. towards God. Is it really just connecting to ourselves as God created us to be and exploring the passions and desires of that soul. Yeah, I feel it's more than that because you, you, the reality is you can connect to yourself and discover yourself without really developing your soul to a large extent. You could remain very fixed and firm in, in what you've discovered yes. rather than realising that you can grow these particular qualities. And also when... I feel a lot of people, when they read the pageant messages, when they look at the qualities and attributes of the soul, they don't consider qualities such as faith, humility, and other qualities such as those qualities. Yes. yes. They sort of see them as um, actions or some other thing. But actually, these are all potentialities that exist in the soul that are a part of its potential nature yeah. that we have to actually embrace and have a desire to embrace in order to develop. So we can't we can't develop anything in our soul that we're not conscious of developing pretty much. And while sometimes subconscious or unconscious development does take place through the law of attraction, working in harmony with the law of compensation, working in harmony with our own experience, and once we fully become aware, which is another quality that we can develop in our soul, yeah. awareness, um, once we fully become aware, we can then engage these actions in a more positive and aware, aware state. And I feel a lot of the times when it's referred to about the qualities of the soul <clears throat> that um, we're capable of exercising, a lot of these qualities all refer to the higher parts of the nature of the soul yes. that the spirits are referring to. But most people interpret them as the personality and attributes and things like that associated with the personality of the individual, which of course are a part of the individual still. Sure. But there's all these other attributes. Even the other half of yourself is an attribute of your soul. And all of these need to also be developed. Great. Yeah, yeah thank mm. you for clarifying that. I also feel that here um, there are the concept of um, the soul dying was, has been misinterpreted in the Bible quite, mm -hmm. quite a lot. There is these, are these statements in the Bible that say the soul itself can die. And in fact, there are statements like in Ezekiel that say the soul that is sinning, it itself will die. So there is this implication from the Bible that the soul itself can die. Now, nobody has ever observed the death of a soul, but they have observed the death of the soul's potentialities through, not, through them not being exercised. Yes. In other words, it's like the person doesn't have a soul even though they do have one, it's just that it's not been developed in any way and the person themselves doesn't even recognise they have one. And there's examples in the Paget messages where a man came to Paget saying, I've lost my soul, I don't know where it's gone. And, uh, but it was just, again, that kind of feeling that he, he'd, he'd not developed his soul in the entire life on earth and now he realised or he's heard that there's a need to develop a soul but now he feels like it's gone and it's lost. And how does he get it back? Yeah. The reality is it's always there. It's just that it can be shriveled up and dried up so much through the lack of exercise that it's like it's not there. And, and that we only operate from our intellect. And we meet, you do meet many people in the spirit world and on earth who basically seem like they have no connection with the soul, their soul or their, even no, any connection with their own love nature even. Sometimes mm. you meet people that feel like that. And, uh, and the reason why is because they've never actually exercised those potentialities because they've never thought that it, they need to. Mm. Or, and in fact, there's usually a lot of fear associated with it too, you know, fear of past events or the, remember, the, the memory of past events where, where they've felt like, oh, it's so, it's so hard to, you know, love somebody and then lose love. So they shut all that part of themselves down. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because the soul is governing everything. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
by shutting it off and shutting it off and trying to distance from it, we actually limit the potential for every other yeah. exploration or endeavour or chance of happiness and try to shut down the soul to avoid the sadness and, yep. and yet it limits everything else. Yeah. yeah. So what he's really talking about in this law is the need to see the importance of developing the soul. Yeah. And... You know, I, I feel quite strongly that at the moment, very few people on earth really see the need of developing their soul. Even people who have heard divine truth really struggle with, the, with focusing their entire life around developing their soul. They have all these other things going on that distract you from the development of the soul, you know, that you finish up doing, trying to get happiness or trying to get some sense of fulfillment, not realising that actually it's the development of the soul that's going to be the most important thing for your entire future, even your future on earth. Yeah. And he does point that out, that even on earth, and in fact he, he re recommends developing it on earth because it's much easier if you develop it on earth for your earth life, but it's also much easier when you arrive in the spirit world. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and part of that is about developing our will, isn't it? And yep. we've been talking about that today a bit already, the two of us. And how you can't really develop your soul if you're not embracing your will, if no. you're not willing to challenge the fear you have about embracing your will. Yeah, most like we discussed today, most people want to give away their will to others. They keep, and and there's and then of course they've got someone to blame other than themselves for doing for for when something goes wrong. So it's all about fear of self responsibility, fear of taking control of your own life, and so forth. But, but you have to have self-responsibility and you have to take control of your own life if you're going to obey the laws of free will. Yeah. Because obeying the laws of free will are, I am personally responsible for my life. Now, if I know that while I'm on earth, I will stop giving up my will to other people around me who potentially are not in as good condition as myself. If I choose to give up my will to other people around me, then I have all, already exercised my will, breaking the law that I was not aware even existed perhaps, but, uh, but I'm breaking the law and the consequences of such, uh, of breaking that law will automatically be re being reflected on my soul. Now, if I understood all that, I would understand, for example, the importance of embracing my will while I'm on earth. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. And that is a part of your soul. That's not a part of your spirit body or your physical body. That's not not a part of the physical laws or the spirit laws. It's a part of the soul-based laws that govern the operation of your soul. So it's a very important thing to learn to embrace. Mm. So what a lot of psychoanalysts talk about in terms of uh, embracing of a person's life are actually parts of developing the potentiality of the soul. Absolutely. Mm. A lot of them talk about developing our will and coming out of denial and yeah. all of those things which are... Which are all soul-based or intell and intellectual-based operations, depending on how we engage them. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, but it's difficult to maintain using our will uh, in a loving direction just using our intellect to guide us, isn't it? Of course, because you it can't feel. It inevitably leads to <laughs> some feeling. Yeah. 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 You know, and this is where developing the soul, if, if everyone understands that developing the soul is all about developing your emotions, developing your feelings, so that those emotions and feelings and, and passions and desires are all in harmony with love, then they would give up this desire for intellectual dominance of their being mm -hmm. and they'd focus more on the soul development and the importance of changing at the soul level. If, if there is an action that's out of harmony with love, then it comes from a feeling inside of the soul that needs to change. And if that feeling changes, then you won't be constantly fighting against it. You'll automatically do something yeah. that, that will change. And he's alluding to those kind of things in that passage. He's basically saying that, isn't he? That um, we need to know, it, it's going to help you so much if you know about the spirit life and these laws that are essentially governed by love. Yeah. And if you develop your soul. Because they not only govern the spirit world, but they also govern our mortal existence. Yes. So, so if you know about them, then your whole existence, including the time that you're on earth, will, will improve. Yeah. He actually says that, there, doesn't he? Uh, that, later on in, in the message, section. I think yeah. he says that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, so you want to continue with the sure. next one? Okay. There is another law of the spirit world that is of vital importance to those in the mortal life and one which they can learn and that is that no man can, that is, that no man can of himself save himself from the penalties of the law of compensation. 
I've written about this before, but it is of such vast importance and affects all human beings to such an extent that I feel justified in saying something more on the subject. This law of compensation is as fixed as any of God's laws and cannot be avoided under any condition or circumstances, except one, and that is the redemption of a man's soul by the love of the Father entering into it and making it at one with his own and like his in all the qualities that partake of the divine essence. I know that many men do not believe that there can be any forgiveness of sin because they say it is impossible to make clean in a moment the soul of a man that has been steeped in everything vile and sinful while living the life of a mortal. Well, this I believe to be true, and I do not think any of our greatest teachers of these highest truths attempt to declare the doctrine of instantaneous cleansing of a vile and sinful soul. At least this is not the doctrine taught by the greatest of all teachers, the man of Nazareth, whom I sometimes see and converse with. And he, I believe, knows more of the laws governing the salvation of men than any other or all other teachers combined. His teaching here is that while a soul is not instantaneously cleansed by receiving a portion of the divine love, as we have heretofore explained it to you, yet the inflowing of such love into the soul of a man starts him in the way of right thinking and causes him to realise that his soul is open to the influence of divine love. So mortals as well as spirits may receive this awakening of divine grace to a very large extent as soon as they realise that this love is the only thing that will remove the penalties of this law of compensation. So perhaps I, what I feel we need to do here is that he's now contrasting two laws actually. Yeah, he so he's not just yeah. mentioning the law of compensation and the effects on, on a man but He's also mentioning the contrast between the law of compensation and the laws of divine love, the laws of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. And so, so he's now suggesting that there's, that there's the law of compensation and then there's the laws of divine love. But the main point he's making is that we can't save ourselves from the penalties of the law of compensation. Mm -hmm. so, so we can't save ourselves at all, in fact, is what he's basically <laughs> saying. We can't. And this, there is this viewpoint that a lot of people I feel you know, on earth sort of have at the moment and also a lot of spirits in the spirit world have at the moment and that's this viewpoint that if I arrive in the spirit world and I find that what I've done on earth wasn't a good thing and you know, it's damaged me, then all I'll do is change my mind and, and do the right thing. Yeah. They almost ignore the fact that there's going to be penalties for doing the wrong thing. Yeah, and in fact, um, he, he alluded, he talked about this in the last message, didn't he? But mm. I know from experience in teaching book group or, or whatever, a lot of people have this issue with this, even the word penalty. Mm. No, no, there's no, no, it's not like that, you know. <laughs> and I understand there's a lot of emotion attached to, perhaps to the, the word, word penalty. Because penalty is often as applied a to punishment. Yeah. sort of a yeah, yep. punitive effect. But but I do feel there is a huge resistance on the earth to just simply the idea that if I choose to do something that's not loving, there will be consequences. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid that all the time here, don't yeah. we? Yeah. And, and you see a lot of people on earth developing this skill of avoidance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when it comes to, for example, when it comes to uh, breaking the law of the land, you know, a lot of people break the law of the land and then when they get caught, there, there, is, a, there is still this manoeuvring and re, you know, regurgitating and, and rephrasing everything in order to manoeuvre themselves out of the consequence that the law imposes. Yeah. That is impossible with God. And that's basically what Joseph is saying here. It's impossible with God that you will be able to manoeuvre yourself out of the consequence and penalty that the law imposes if you've broken it. Yeah. And, and I feel this is a very important thing for most people to realise. Even before we discuss the two, the two yeah. sides of the compensating for the breaking of the yeah. law, we need to understand that we are not going to be able to manoeuvre ourselves out of the consequence the law imposes. Mm -hmm. And that applies to every single law that we've ever broken, whether we knew the law or not at the time. 
Now, of course, if we know the law at the time, then the consequence will be even more firmly uh, implied. Yeah. But even if you don't know the law at the time, it, it'll be relatively, if you, it, it might be relatively easy to fix the problem afterwards, but you're still going to have to pay the consequence. You're still going to have to have the penalty imposed. Yes. And, and I feel that a lot of people believe that, oh, if I wasn't, if I'm not conscious of the law, then God wouldn't imply the penalty. Yes. And that's not true at all. In fact, it's very false to believe such a thing. And then a lot of people believe that even though God does imply the penalty, that you're going to say, have some kind of uh, argument with God, you know, some kind of negotiation. <laughs> yeah. that, Explain your reasoning yeah, quite well which, and, yeah, you know, and, and he'll you, understand. And he'll understand and you'll get off. Yeah. And that's not the way it works either. And it's very important for people to understand that God is not the same as human lawmakers and, and law mm -hmm. controllers, what, what would you call them? Uh, you know, like the police, legal system. policemen, oh, if you like. I see, yeah. God's not the same as that. God, they can't, these ones on earth might be able to be negotiated with, but God's laws are never going to be able to be negotiated with. You either must embrace the full extent of the law or you've got another law that you'll have to, mm. you know, you can embrace that might be higher that will finish up overcoming the lower. But either way, you're under law. There's no, there's no escape from that fact. And I, I found people have a lot of resistance to this idea um, because especially this idea of ignorance. I didn't know what loving was. Mm. So how can I be expected to, you know, pay have a consequence to that action yeah. and I feel that it's very logical and loving why because God's designed his whole universe that we could come to understand what love is mm. and even in it from a state of ignorance actually that we could come to know what love is mm. and yes it's painful that a lot of us haven't been shown what love is in our childhood and we don't grow up and understand it fully but God's designed these consequences to help us understand what love is. Exactly. And so it's not actually, um, it's not actually punitive at all. It's a, it's a loving lesson. Yeah. And it sort of demonstrates the condition of heart who wants to rebel against that is someone who does feel not just a sense of, oh, I didn't know. Because if we thought, oh, I didn't know, we'd go, thanks for letting me know. Wow, I feel pretty, some stuff about that. I might feel a bit bad or whatever and mm. go off and, but I want to remedy myself. But the, the heart that says, no, that's not fair, I didn't know, it indicates they already have a justification for what they were doing inside of them exactly. and a resistance to desire to know what love is actually, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. And I was just thinking about our discussion this morning about free will yeah. and your own rebellion of fe using fear as an excuse. Yeah. And I was just thinking it would probably be a great thing to relate in the case of the law. Like, as I explained to you this morning, that you're constantly breaking the law of free will by abdicating your will and giving it to another person. Mm -hmm. Like, when you do that, you're breaking the law of free will and so you are going to pay the penalty of the consequences of giving your will across to another person. And then you can't very well complain when that other person gets you to do something that afterwards you go, oh, I regret doing that. Well, of course you're going to have regrets because you've just broken the law for a start. Yeah. And, and if you broke the law by giving up your will, then, then of course there are going to be penalties that occur as a result of you doing so. So I was thinking about this law of free will is, that we'd raised just earlier how most people don't realise that when they don't take full responsibility for their own life and they don't exercise their will exactly as they desire it to be, they are automatically breaking the law of free will and there is automatically a consequence upon them for the breakage of that law. Yeah. And, and it's almost like most people want to say, but, but I did it because I was afraid. So what? <laughs> yeah, so what? that's what God feels. That's what God says. So what? You're afraid. That is a problem because oh, I don't feel you have anything to be afraid of. Right? <laughs> I've made a universe that you can live in and, and you can even die and still be alive. So, you know, you've got nothing to be afraid of. And when we say, oh, but I did it because of my fear, I did it because I was afraid of what they would do to me and all those kind of things, all we're doing is abdicating or using that to abdicate our, our own will. And really what we're doing is we're placing our fear our internal law, yes. fear, above God's law of free will. Now, because we're doing that, we have everything's out of harmony, of course. God wants us to see that God's law of free will is far more important than our fear. 
And if we honoured the law of free will, we, we might still have fear, but we wouldn't act upon our fear. We wouldn't do things that our fear dictates. We wouldn't do and take actions that finish up causing the damage of our own soul and others. Yeah. And we certainly wouldn't abdicate our will because we realise the importance of our will being the gift that God has given us. Yeah, and, and as I said to you this morning, it's such an insidious problem. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, how I myself personally come up to a fear, and I'm not even thinking about it. I just go, oh, I can't do that because I'm so afraid. Or even I, I recognise a truth or I recognise what I want, but I'm a bit afraid of confronting people, so I water it all down. Mm -hmm. And, and in just broken that, the law. <laughs> in that act, I've broken a law. Yeah. And as, I, as we were talking, as you know, I had this series Epiphany. of <laughs> epiphanies about it. But I realised yeah. that, um, as you were speaking about, when I put the fear above the law of, of free will, and really God's placed us here on earth, especially in our first incarnation, just to understand that we have a, we're individuals with a will. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that One I'm of the looking. Most important. <laughs> yes, sure. and how can we really express ourselves or become know ourselves as individuals if we don't embrace this law? So yeah. Yeah. obviously, God really wants me to learn about this. Yeah. So um, when I place fear above that law, I realize well, God's going to have a consequence just. For that action alone, for ignoring my free will, there's a consequence yeah. of a law of compensation, if you like, yeah. um, for just ignoring and not honouring that law. Yeah. So then, whenever you gave your will to another, you were ignoring that law. Yep. Yeah, so there's one pe penalty, if you like, mm -hmm. through the law of compensation. Then there's the additional law of compensation of just living in fear, of mm -hmm. honouring fear. Mm -hmm. This is a separate kind of a consequence. Mm -hmm. And then there's the third issue that if I'm living in fear and fear is driving the restriction or the changing of my will, then I'm likely going to be pleasing people who are either demanding or in a state of fear themselves. Mm. So this is also causing me to use my will where it could be used in, term, in love and truth. And often, as you know, I know truth mm. and I, I would act on it more mm. if it wasn't for fear. So I'm actually degrading my condition by bending to the will of people who are in fear, mm. as I myself am. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another, that's another compensatory effect upon my soul. Another consequence. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And as I was washing up, I was going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this is too much. You know, this is a lot that I'm actually doing to damage. And then damage. from memory, while you were washing up, I mentioned the fact that in giving your will to other people, potentially you're giving your will to billions and billions and billions of other people, which means that whoever you're with at the time, you do what they want. And you're with another person, you do what they want. You're with another person, you do what they want. And, and there are billions of people. So that means there's billions of things you're going to have to do. And sometimes two of those people were next to each other right in front of you. And now you have confusion. And that is also a consequence. Absolutely. of breaking just, this law of free will. This kind of distress of, I, can't, I, can't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. do. I don't know yep. what to do. If you knew your own will, you'd probably know what to do. Yeah. So you would always act in yeah. harmony with your will. So, so the, the fact is, and then I talk to you about the simplicity of God's law, is that God's asking you to connect with your will and also to consider God's. Yeah. Two people, if you like. <laughs> yeah. So for instead, of, instead of considering billions of people's will and having to do what they want and, and never really know yourself and feeling like you're totally burdened and, and of course, getting all the consequences of, of choosing to do things that are out of harmony yeah. with love. And, and of course, God's saying to you, well, no, you chose it. Doesn't matter who influenced you. You chose it. That's the law in operation. That's the law in operation. I want you to know whatever you choose is your yeah. responsibility. And God's saying, your, it's your responsibility, your soul, nobody else's. So if your soul went and chose a, a thing that was out of harmony with others, that's your concern, not anybody else's. It doesn't matter how much they influenced you, berated you, belittled you, humiliated you, attacked you, it's still your, it's still your choice. Yeah. And you could have chosen to act differently. And, uh, and this is where we, we don't honour the law. We go, oh, no, my fear is more important than the law. And this is something very powerful you said to me. You said, your problem is not fear. Your problem is that you don't want to honour the law. Exactly. And Salyards is really saying this. He's saying, learn the laws, follow the laws. And, 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 and your fear will automatically come up. You, your development happens as a result, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like if, if you followed the law of free will as you understand it, even intellectually, 
you will be put, put and placed in situations where people will want you to do things <laughs> that you go, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm going to have to say, even though I don't want to say, and if I say, they might get angry with me or they get upset with me, and there's your fear. Like, if you just say, then they get angry and then you let yourself feel the fear and you can still proceed. And when we honour the law above the emotion, then we have a chance to feel the emotions. But if we honour the emotion above the law, we only have a chance to feed our addictions. Yep. And that's a big problem that people have, I feel. I feel it's a massive problem. Mm -hmm. I feel it's completely insidious and entrenched yeah. for most people. Yeah. Like if anyone watching, you know, if you recognise yourself as a people pleaser, <laughs> This is what you're doing exactly. all the time. You Breaking know? the law constantly. Breaking the law constantly. <laughs> how, how can you? Uh, like, how can we grow towards God and God's nature if we're just breaking one of His most fundamental laws? Constantly? So this is why a lot of people pleasers go. Nothing goes right for me. What's going <laughs> wrong? You know, I try my best to do my best for everybody, and yet still. It seems like I don't have many friends and I don't, you know, my life is still a I'm bit a nice of a mess. Guy. I'm no. a nice person. Yeah. But they're not realising they're constantly breaking a law and, and as a result of constant breaking a law, there's a constant penalty imposed upon the soul uh, through the law of compensation that you cannot avoid. Yeah. And if you, there's pain, for, pain occurring in your life, it's because you're breaking laws. Like, and so a lot of people I feel who are in fear and are way, you know, worrying about pleasing this person, pleasing that person and so forth, they're constantly breaking the law of free will and then they're expecting to have no penalty. Yeah. They're expecting to have no consequence. And this is what Joseph is basically saying. We need to understand that every time the law of love is broken and the law of free will is, is about the law of love, yeah. every time the law of love is broken, I am going to have a penalty that's going to be painful, a consequence that's going yeah. to be painful, even if I believe I've done the right thing. Yes, exactly. It's going to be a painful consequence. So we need to look at the consequences yeah. and examine them and see them as compensatory effects upon a, a, an untruth that we have imbibed and live by. Yeah. And to give um, context just to that discussion, how that applies to this free will discussion we were having in terms of consequences, um, I sat down and said to you, now hang on, mathematically, something is really off here because if I'm always modifying my will mm -hmm. to meet the demands or the, what I perceive as the demands, just what my fear tells me I should do, yeah. what others want, or I'm always breaking my will in this way. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, that means whenever I do that, whenever I use my will, there's negative consequences. Three of them I've already listed, but yeah. another one There's is... hundreds, actually. <laughs> yeah, also yeah. the resentment that comes. A lot of people pleasers end up becoming quite cranky people because yeah. they, they resent the fact that internally they know they're never doing what they want. Exactly. And it, it, it eventually breeds resentment. So there's 100% there's of the time that I break this law, things are, there's a negative, cons multiple negative consequences. consequences. Neg multiple. And because it's such a big law, there's going, whenever we break big laws, there's always like often hundreds of consequences happening all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, when we break a small law, like one law, like the law of gravity, the, the single consequence, we might break our leg, you know. Yeah. Break, yeah. But, but when we break a huge law, like the law of free will, law. there's so many aspects of our life that are affected by it. No wonder we're unhappy. And no wonder we're unhappy. And I was telling you that one of my dreads is that I will use my will and, and be unloving and hurt someone. Mm -hmm. And then I had the light bulb moment that, hang on, when I'm doing this other thing where I'm trying to please everyone or, you know, pander to my fear all the time yeah. and not use my will in a, in a strong, certain way, then 100% of the time things are going badly and I'm being unloving. And 100% of the time you're breaking the law. Yeah. So you're thinking that, no, that's when you're trying to it's... meet the law of love. But 100% of the time you're breaking the law of love. The law of love doesn't enter. Mm. Whereas if I go ahead and use my will, okay, some of the time... You might use I it might be badly. Unloving. <laughs> but if I, especially if I know I have the desire I want to be a loving person, then, yeah. you know, then there's, there's a percentage of the time where I will be loving and I will be growing. Yeah. So mathematically... Something's You're in not, a better place already. Yeah, yes. <laughs> not adding up the way. And I'm there's living. automatically going to be less consequence, and as a result of that, you'll be happier. Exactly. So, <laughs> and if you're not breaking hundreds of laws of time, and you're only broken just one when you do an action, <laughs> obviously, even mathematically, when things go wrong, there, you're only having to have one compensatory effect. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, I feel that most people have, and we need to talk more about the laws of free will, and there's pageant messages we'd like to talk about that. Yeah. But it gives an illustration, I feel, of the point that Joseph is making in that people who are in fear do believe that they should be able to get away with the results of their fear. Because the fear actually says, no, I can't. That's it's right. impossible. So right. no, no, there shouldn't be a consequence because doesn't everyone see I can't do it? Exactly. And, and, the, and the reality is there will be cons- compensatory effects for, for living in fear, just as there are compensatory effects for living in every error that we have that's out of harmony with love. Yeah. And fear is one of the biggest things that is out of harmony with love and truth. So, so we must understand this underlying principle of the law of compensation. Now, now how to fix it is different to the, its creation. Yeah. So fixing it, there's two ways. We can either go through the law of compensation or we can go through the laws of divine love, but we must understand we have to go through something because if we don't, we, we, the, 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 there would be no such thing as the law. The reality is we are going to go through something, whether it be the law of compensation or the laws of divine love, we are going to go through it, whether we like the idea or not, even, yes. we are yeah. going to go through it. And that's how all of God's laws operate. They all operate whether we like the idea of them operating or not <laughs> and whether we're rebellious or not. Yeah. And we need to see it as that. Yes. And that we, we need to also see that we can't save ourselves from it. Once we've engaged the action that broke the law of love, the penalty is present immediately and there is no way we can avoid its consequence. We, we can't do anything to avoid its consequence. So instead of living in fear about every action, what we need to do is start analysing what are the laws. If we understood the laws, then we'd know how to not break them and therefore be be free of the potential consequences of breaking them. And, And this is what he's basically saying. We need to learn the laws. We need to understand them. And then we won't engage in action that would result in a compensatory effect or, or a penalty on our soul, and that will free us from having to go through a lot of pain later yes. uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. But no man can, through the exercise of his own will, avoid the consequences. He can only avoid, through the exercise of the will, breaking the law in the first place. Exactly. And once the consequence is there, then there's the two laws that he's, he's sort of touching on. The the slow grinding of the compensation yeah. or the the inflowing of divine love that he, he yeah. mentions here. Yeah. yeah. And so when he speaks about the inflowing of divine love, he also mentions that there is no such thing as an instantaneous cleansing of the soul, even with divine love. Yeah. So I feel a lot of people sort of, a lot of, and a lot of Christians have this concept of all I've got to do is trust in the blood of Jesus and then I'm saved and then from that moment on, no matter, almost no matter what I do, I'm always saved sort of this kind of thing. And then, of course, that contradicts other verses in the Bible, so they, they have a lot of confusion about that. But there is this concept that I see still a lot of people wanting to be true, and that is that I can make an instantaneous change. And when they observe a person who does make an instantaneous change, they go, oh, isn't it wonderful? What are you doing? And yeah. all they're often doing is they're being overcloaked by a spirit. And that's how they made their instantaneous change. (laughs) Which is a huge abdication of the law of free will. (laughs) Which broke the law of free will, which then means there's going to be a consequence at some further point down the track, probably when they hit the spirit world, because they probably won't realise it before then. And so I feel even this concept of instantaneous change enables a lot of people in spiritual new age paths to believe that instantaneous change is possible and unfortunately causes them to abdicate their will and have spirits overcloak them, yeah. which unfortunately then causes further compensatory effects and penalties on their soul for breaking the laws of free will, abdicating their own will. And, and they don't realise that until they pass into the spirit world. And isn't there also in the Christian faith this idea of, right, I have to believe that your blood saved me and that I'm saved. There's no such thing as like... And as long um, as I believe I am saved. Yeah, as long as I have that one belief, that's it. It's Mm. instantaneous. Mm. It's not based on what I do in my life. Or Or what actions I have to take or or the reception of God's love or any of those things. Yeah, and I know in Islam there's a similar, you know, we have to acknowledge Muhammad and it's, this, this is how I become a Muslim. Like this, And Allah and pray, pray every day. And, and there's this a set of rules and then... As long as I engage those rules, I'm saved. Yeah, then it's an instantaneous mm. ticket kind mm. of kind of thing which yeah. is 
Which is also not, not true. The truth. Yeah. yeah. And and so this whole concept of instantaneous cleansing not a, is not only in the Christian faith, but it's also in a lot of other faiths and 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 even in the New Age movement where they mm. believe they can instantaneously have a change, and from then on they are a completely different person. Well, and it, we see it reflected in the physical world all the time. There's a huge desire for instantaneous changes, and mm -hmm. we were just talking before we started filming about going on a one week fast, cleanse, <laughs> detox, and then we're healthy and, you know, liposuction and all yeah. these things that just suddenly it's, it's all better now. Yeah. And it's really an attempt to avoid the consequence. The, the consequences of what's happening inside of our body and outside of our soul yep. as a result of our actions, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And if we truly understood this principle, I feel this principle that we can't save ourselves, we would be, firstly, very concerned about the actions we take, not fearful, but concerned. We would want to know what's in harmony and out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. And we'd want to know. We wouldn't want to ignore it. Like a lot of people on the planet, I feel, and a lot of people even have heard divine truth, almost have this feeling as, oh, I'd like to ignore that truth. I'll ignore that truth. I like that truth. So I'll take that truth. <laughs> I'll ignore that one, ignore that. So it's almost like plucking trues, you know, like we yeah. go, we go yeah. picking apricots or plucking trues in the same yeah. way. Oh, I don't like that one, don't like that one, like that one, take that one. And, and we don't realise in that state that every time we leave one of the things that we haven't picked, the laws that we haven't picked, we try to ignore the truth of those particular laws. We are now, we are now choosing ignorance, which is again breaking the law of free will, choosing yeah. lack of self-responsibility, but it's breaking a lot of other laws. We choose ignorance so that we can try to get away from some future penalty and it's not going to work mm -mm. and we need to understand that. Mm. And I feel uh, uh, for a lot of people, they're picking this truth, leaving that truth, picking this truth, leaving that truth, and they're only picking the ones that they they like, mm -hmm. and they're leaving the ones they don't like, and then in the end they expect themselves to be happy. It's impossible. Yeah. And you, whether you embrace the laws of divine love or natural love, you can't pick and choose. You've got to. You can pick and choose which laws you're embracing in the sense of like the laws of natural love or the laws of divine love, you can choose that. But you can't pick and choose because all of the laws are actually imposed upon you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you picked or choose and choose them or not, they are all imposed, the penalties are all imposed for the breaking of these particular laws, whether you wanted to have a knowledge of them or not. Yeah, and, and partly I love that he says, he talks about this idea of divine love not being an instantaneous cleansing of you because... I, there's a lot of reasons for that, but partly it's because God wants you to understand the consequences as you go on. Exactly. There's no way you can know all the consequences in an instant. It's a, it, God's fostering the growth of our soul all of the time through his laws. And yep. there's, yes, laws that supersede other laws and make our progress easier and faster, yep. but he never wants us to miss a lesson. No. He, never. And, yeah. and I love that. And I in fact, that. the way he's designed the universe is that in the end, you can't miss any lesson unless, <laughs> you know, if you miss a lesson, you stagnate at some point. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you, you can't progress further. Yeah. yeah. It says here um, that uh, Salyard says, yet the inflowing of such love into the soul of a man starts him into the way of right thinking and causes him to realise that his soul is open to the influence of this divine love. And I just wanted to talk to you about that point because we had a nice discussion about that just the other day as well, mm. um, about this issue of when we feel so terrible about ourselves and we feel quite unlovable, often that drives a lot of our actions that are in disharmony with love. Mm. And sometimes it's just the very um, event of receiving God's love helps to let us know this truth that, oh, I am, I am lovable. Yeah. And, and that's what it made me think of when I read um, uh, Sally saying, it starts a man into the right way of thinking. We start to have beliefs that are more in harmony with God's, don't we? And that alters the use of our will. Yeah, so if we can at least exercise a desire to receive love in the first instance, just a little bit of the inflowing of love will cause us to change the way in which we think to a degree because we'll... We'll stop, for example, the example that you gave, we, we stop believing all the time that we're unlovable, for example, because mm -hmm. um, we, we know that we have received divine love and we remember that. And so we remember, oh, well, God loved me then. So, you know, that's proof that I am lovable. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so we start to change. So, so even though we might not have embraced the full truth of it yet, we, we are already on the road to changing, mm -hmm. which is what he's basically referring to. And, and in this section, he's basically referring to the two ways of changing, one using the law of compensation and the other using the laws of divine love. And um, with the law of compensation, we have to exercise the effort to change and the desire to experience the penalty. Mm -hmm. has to be present. But, uh, and if it's not present, we still experience the penalty, but we, we often have rebellion against the penalty. Yeah. Um, with which the laws, prolongs it. Which it? prolongs yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, whereas with the laws of divine love, once we exercise repentance and, and if, if it's something we've done and forgiveness when it's something somebody else has done, then uh, we're now engaging a whole different group of laws which open our heart differently yeah. uh, and open our experience differently as a result. Yeah. And, and would you say that one of the big powers of that law of repentance and forgiveness is because it opens our heart in a different way, we learn truth more rapidly from God, whereas when we're in compensatory actions, it's just sort of, we can't, we can't ignore the law that God's placing upon us, but mm. we're doing it on our own and we're having to learn on our own. And even before then, generally, there's this part of us that's quite rebellious, so... so you know, the fact that we're not repenting is already an indication that we are rebellious about repenting. Yes. <laughs> in other words, we don't want to recognise we've done the wrong thing. We don't want to recognise that we've broken the law. So, if, so, for example, in our previous discussion about fear, most of the people who would have heard that discussion goes, what, you're telling me that fear is breaking one of God's laws? Yes, definitely, of course it is. Yeah. And you're telling me that fear has its own law of compensation effects? Certainly it will. Um, and you're telling me that even if somebody threatens me with my life and I go along with them, that I've broken the law. Yes, you have. And, and so forth. And, the, and these particular, the, this hand on the hips type <laughs> feeling that most people have, of, what, what, this can't be true, is the rebellion, yeah. is the rebellion against the law. And the rebellion against the law means that you're actually even rebelling against the law of compensation. But you can't rebel in, from a soul perspective. It, 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 the penalty is now imposed. Mm -hmm. Bang. Mm -hmm. yeah, the penalty is on your soul, the consequence is on your soul. And you now have a choice to repent, which is the engaging the laws of divine love. If you repent with, when you're in, in harmony with God, you know, mm -hmm. in, when you're in the discussion with God, or you engage the laws of natural love, which is repentance as John the Baptist taught in the Bible. Um, other than that, you're fighting. You're, yeah. you're rebelling. You're fighting. Yeah. You're fighting, fighting, fighting. And, and I feel the majority of people on the planet still fight. And even the majority of people have heard divine truth still fight everything, fight everything, fight everything. And then wonder why they feel so morose at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> They're learning more and more laws and fighting all of them <laughs> at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And of course, the consequences of such an action can't be good. Mm -hmm. So you end, up, you end up feeling quite morose when you do that, right? Yeah. So if you, if you want to be happy, the key is to study the law, understand the law, learn as much as you possibly can about it, engage it in your life, and then just feel the emotions that are present. The emotions will come up as a result of the penalties or consequences. And if you're repentant for them, they'll just flow out of you quite easily. If you're resistive of them, then the law of compensation is going to hammer you, hammer you, hammer you, hammer you, hammer you, hammer you until, until you go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I thought we'd continue because yeah, yeah, this absolutely. is part of the continuance of this discussion. So maybe I'll read the next mm -hmm. portion of this. It says, I do not believe that immediately after the sinner feels this love coming into his soul, he becomes a saint and at once gets rid of his evil nature, for that can hardly be. Such an instantaneous cleansing would scarcely serve the purpose for which the work of this redemptive love is intended. Some persons seem to be able to receive more of this love in a short time than do others, and consequently their complete redemption is more quickly accomplished. But to me, and I have experienced the inflowing of this love and its effects upon my sinful nature and upon my recollections of the deeds of my earth life, which call into operation this law of compensation, there does not seem to be any probability of an instantaneous cleansing of the soul so that a man suddenly becomes fitted to lift in the, live in the celestial heavens where the Father's love in all its purity and completeness exists. I know it is taught by many preachers, and it is also the dogma of some churches, 
that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin and that in the twinkling of an eye, but you must not believe this for that is not true. The blood of Jesus was spilled many centuries ago and is now become a part of other elements of the natural world and cannot save anyone. And I go further and say, as Jesus has taught me, that his blood never had any efficacy in saving anyone. He never taught that his blood could do any such thing or that the shedding of his blood was in any sense the means of saving a soul. He is not now teaching any such doctrine and is disappointed that those who lead the masses of mankind should teach such a doctrine because it takes their attention away from the one and vital principle which is necessary to their salvation and that is the new birth which means merely the flowing into a man's soul and becoming a part of it of the divine love of the Father. It does not come to a man because the blood of Jesus was a sacrifice to appease the wrath and requirements of the Father or because of any vicarious suffering of Jesus. So there's a bit of an aside that he that he's yes. doing there. He, obviously, um, he was referring again to this principle of instantaneous cleansing and how flawed it is as a, as a concept and, and that it has no bearing generally in the person's day-to-day -day life. Even Christians who believe in it know that the very next day after they've had a belief in Jesus' sacrifice, that they still often feel very much the same as they felt before that belief existed. Now, if that is the case, if a person feels the same before a belief existed and then feels identically the same after or almost the same after a belief existed, then it means that the belief itself had no bearing mm -hmm. on their life. Mm -hmm. And if our lives as Christians are very much the same before we became a Christian in the sense of um, we still have similar troubles and similar anxieties and similar things happening to our body and all those kind of things, which are all law of compensation effects on our disharmony with love. Yeah. And we have very similar things after. So, for example, if we caught God cancer before and we still have cancer after, then it means the thing in between didn't work, <laughs> quite obviously. Yes. And, 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 you know, so, so the fact is that if, if Christians were instantaneously saved at the soul level, there'd be no cancer amongst all Christians, for example. Yeah. Right? Because that would be proof or evidence that there was a change. But the fact is there is no change. And the reason why is because there was no efficacy in the belief. Mm -hmm. If the belief was efficient, then it would cause the change that, that would be measurable. Yeah. And this is something we need to understand with all truth is that, is that truth, when properly engaged, will always cause change, always. Truth, when it's not properly engaged, will never cause change. Mm -hmm. um, either it's not understood or it's not truth, one of the two. Yeah. And this is one thing I suggest to people who are listening to our teachings is that, is that if, if they're listening to our teachings and nothing's changing in their life, it means they're not embracing the teachings because things have changed in my life <laughs> <laughs> through embracing the teachings. It only requires one person to demonstrate something. Yeah. It doesn't require masses to demonstrate something. So, so if a person believes they're following what I am teaching, and my life is changing, but theirs is not, this is proof that they are not following my teachings, yeah. quite simply. And they must understand that. I feel the majority of people don't understand that. They see our lives changing and they go, okay, their lives are changing, but when they listen to the divine truth, their life isn't, they look at us and say our life's changing, yeah. but when they look at themselves and, and look at their life and see that it's not changing or not changing very little, it means that they're not following the things that we're actually teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that they must understand. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so All can right. you re read the next two yep. paragraphs? Mm. Okay. Um, but to return to this law of compensation, no man by his own exertions can save himself from the operations of this law. And he, so long as he has this idea of depending on his own powers, will have to pay the penalties. Of course, as he pays these penalties, he progresses nearer and nearer to a time and condition when the law will cease to operate upon him and he will become comparatively happy. 
but such a payment may require long years of suffering and unhappiness. So I say, let man know that for every act and deed, and for not doing what he should have done, he will have to answer the law. I do not mean by this repetition to cause men to think that I delight in showing them that they will have to suffer and live in darkness for a time <laughs> uncertain. For I do not take any pleasure in calling their attention to this great law and the certainty of its operations. Rather, I do this to help men to avoid these sufferings and unhappiness by seeking the love of the Father while on earth, because, from my observations, I believe that it can be found more easily while in the flesh than after a man becomes a spirit. Mm. So the first paragraph, I thought, was, is just so important for people to understand that you cannot save yourself by your own exertions. Mm -hmm. Once the law is broken, there's nothing you can do but pay the penalties. And if you have no other external things, such as God's love helping you through this process, then you're going to go through a whole process of paying the penalties for the, for the rest of your existence until the penalty is paid. Yes. And once the penalty is paid, you'll be happy. <laughs> but you still won't be at one with God or, or, or have received divine love. Mm. This is what the process of self-reliance is like. You, you will still have to pay the penalty, still pay the penalty. Once the penalty is completely paid, you'll be comparatively happy and you won't be suffering anymore, but you still won't be at one with God through that process. So can, can I ask you to clarify this idea of paying the penalty? Mm -hmm. Because I know, and there's a number of movies actually that demonstrate this idea of someone doing something that they feel that, that was terrible. They took a life, mm -hmm. um, sometimes inadvertently or sometimes on purpose, but they then had this sort of recognition that this is a terrible thing, or they lived in a state of um, terrible self-punishment as mm. we see, it's the, but I see it on earth as well. Mm. But then they engage in a number of acts with other people to try and pay a penalty, if you like. Mm. Now, if I, for example, run over someone and end their life and then I spend the rest of my days volunteering in nursing homes and uh, feeding orphans and uh, doing all these kind of works, am I paying a penalty? No. So because what does it mean to pay the penalty? Well, you know, guilt could be the motivator of your act. So that's fear. Mm -hmm. So fear is breaking another law. So there's another compensatory effect for that. Yeah. So just because you've taken an action that you believe is based around f fixing the problem, the, the paying of a penalty is related to the problem itself and, not, and to its solution, not to going and engaging and fixing another problem that is similar in nature. And uh, I feel there's a bit, while a person on earth can go and do something differently, they can change their life and do something differently. And that's certainly going to benefit their soul in other areas. Mm -hmm. It will not benefit their soul necessarily in paying the penalty for the th act that they committed. Yeah. So, so if, if, for example, let's say in a fit of rage, we, hit, we punch somebody and uh, they knock their head and became a paraplegic, let's mm -hmm. say. And uh, then we spend the rest of our life looking after that person, right? That, that is not strictly paying the penalty for the act. Yeah. Now the act was driven by a soul condition. The, my, my willingness to punch the person is the actual problem, not what happened as a result of the punching of that person. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so if I'm truly going to be focused on the law of compensation and what its penalty it demands, I'd be looking at why did I take the act of punching the person? And there's a whole heap of beliefs that might be underneath that, you know, coming from I'm allowed to express my rage in violence right the way through to I'm allowed to be violent towards people. Um, you know, they might, I might feel that they have deserved my violence and so forth and so forth. There's so many different things that we need to look at. And it's the soul condition in those particular aspects that attract the penalties. Mm -hmm. And one of such penalties is actually hitting somebody and causing their um, paraplegia, yeah. which then makes me realise that, way, way, I'm way out of line here with love somehow. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was one of the penalties yeah. of the soul's already present condition. Mm. 
And so I can fix that one penalty, right, which is by maybe nursing the person for the rest of their life. I might choose to do that, for example. Or out of guilt, I might do it for other people. But if I, unless I address the underlying soul-based causes of what caused me to take the act, then the penalty is not paid. It still exists. It still yeah. exists. And often, I, like, I see that people become driven into works all in an effort just to avoid the pain of guilt. what? The really. pain of guilt, uh, the pain of recognition that I feel responsible or yep. whatever it is. And actually connecting to that pain empowers us into this other law of repentance very rapidly, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's much more advisable to engage that law. Yeah. But if you don't, you can even be thinking that you're paying the penalty of an act when in fact you're creating more penalties for yeah. your soul. And this is where you must be really honest with yourself as to what's really going on and what was the underlying cause of the action being taken, not its effect. Mm -hmm. Now, the law, whenever we sin or we break the law, you could say that sin is almost the effect of breaking the law, not the cause. The cause is something that's inside of us, that's out of harmony with love, that causes us to, to act in a sinful manner mm -hmm. or a manner that breaks the law, breaks the harmony of love. And if while this thing is inside of us, it will continue to motivate us to do other things. Now, these events that we attract do usually, you know, rub off the edges of that particular, of that particular unloving demand or problem that's in our soul. So, example, if I punch somebody and then there was a big accident as a result and they got severely injured as a result and it was only one punch, what I previously thought was okay behaviour would obviously markedly change after that event because I'd go, wow, like I didn't realise the potential damage. I could even kill somebody just by punching them mm -hmm. once. So, so we would now re have more of an idea of the seriousness of taking such an act, which would then help us modify the underlying reason for the, why we took the act in the first place, yeah. which means that it is having some kind of effect on changing our soul. But, but while we don't address the full cause, then the full effect of the penalty will still have to be felt at some point in the yeah. future. The, the, the operation of the law is designed to bring us closer to this. Well, it, you could almost say that the law of compensation is designed to do two things. We either come to a point of forgetfulness mm -hmm. through the law of compensation, and by forgetfulness I mean that we forget that we even did that thing in our history, yeah. or, and it's not through denial, it's through openly willing to look at it again and again and again, or we go through a process of repentance. The law of compensation is also helping us to come to a point at some point of repentance, which is starting to engage some of God's higher laws. Yeah. 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 So that's the purpose of the law. But uh, I feel most people don't fully understand perhaps the purpose of the law. Mm. And I also feel that it's important, um, this, sec this section about um, why he's saying these things. Like a lot of people have this presumption, particularly when they only listen to one or two of our presentations, they have this presumption that I'm telling people things about themselves because I want to pull them down or something. Yeah. And that's not true at all. I'm telling them because it affects their entire future life. <laughs> And, and I have an interest in the happiness of their future life. And so I feel quite like that if I have the opportunity to share the truth with them, that I want to share the truth about the potentiality of their future life and what they're currently doing and how it affects their future life. So I feel a lot of people avoid truth and almost blame the person telling them the truth when uh, by, by assuming the motive of the person telling them the truth is wrong. And just as somebody could read this passage and go, all that, all that Joseph Sally is trying to do is make me feel afraid of the law of conversation. No, he's not. What he's trying to do is make you be aware of the law of conversation <laughs> yeah. and how much it affects your entire future life. And in fact, um, he, it's evident what the gift he's trying to give and you yourself try to give to many people all the time from this end sentence that he says um, that it's important to seek the love of the Father while on earth because from my observations, it can be found more easily here. So mm. actually he and you are doing all that you can to let people know the easier way because mm. as you've said numerous times in our discussion, the law exists. You cannot avoid. You can't avoid it even if you want to ignore it. You can't, you're yeah. not going to avoid its consequences. So the sooner you, you know about this, 
the easier things are going to go. Yeah, and, and I think uh, as humanity, we need to be far less rebellious about understanding the, the beautiful facts of law, particularly laws that God create. Now, man's laws are not always loving, right? But God's laws are always loving. If there's a law that God's created, there's a loving purpose for it every yeah. single time. Yeah. And every time we rebel, we're basically rebelling against love. What a silly thing to do. <laughs> like, we're better, off, we're better off accepting the law and, and wanting to come to understand it more fully rather than trying to reject the law and go, oh, I don't want to know about that one. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we have a presentation and people come up after and say, why did you have to tell me all of those things? You know, now there's a whole heap more things I've got to consider. And I go, well, because it's an act of love for, for you to know all of these laws. And that way there's a chance that at some point in the future, if you contemplate them, you won't break them as much. Mm -hmm. And if you don't break them as much, you're going to be happier. <laughs> Truth creates opportunity, doesn't it? Always. And that's something that uh, I think people, we dread truth, but we don't recognise it grants us opportunity. Always, and yeah. even if we don't take it right now, we yeah. have that opportunity in the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, now it is my turn. Um, yes, read. your turn. Um, so this is the, th the fourth, really, law that he's discussing in this passage, which is the last one. Yeah. Another law of the spirit world is that every human being of one sex has, on earth or in the spirit world, one of the opposite sex, who is his soulmate. The importance of this provision of the Father for the happiness of humans and spirits has never been fully understood by those who have not with certainty met and recognised their soulmates. I know that on earth men have claimed that certain of the opposite sex were their affinities, and with such claims as an excuse have done much wrong and sin. But the soulmate is not an affinity which may be suggested by the passions or desires, but is one provided by the grace and love of the Father to live with the other soulmate through all eternity. Before they took on the form of flesh, they were united. And when, in accordance with God's plan, they separated and became mortals, they became no less soulmates, although they may not recollect their former unity or relationship while living in the mortal life. But as certain as God lives, these two soulmates at some time after they become spirits will learn their true relationship to each other and will, if nothing insurmountable intervenes, come together again in true union and happiness. The mere fact that a certain man and a certain woman are husband and wife on earth does not mean that they will live together as husband and wife through all eternity. If they are soulmates, they may, but if they are not, they will certainly separate after they enter the spirit world. That true relationship cannot be hidden here and no mere form of relationship of husband and wife will suffice to keep the persons together. The great truth of soulmates is one which needs further elucidation and one which I will try hereafter to explain more fully. But for now, it is sufficient to say that every man born of woman who has his soulmate, either on earth or in the spirit world and vice versa, well, I've written a great deal to you tonight and you're tired and so am I. And so I will continue at another time the rest of my discourse. With all my love and best wishes for your happiness and success, I am your old professor and friend, Salyards. So this is the last, the last law was, uh, mm -hmm. that he wanted to mention was the law of, of soulmates. It's interesting, I find, that this law of soulmates that we present, we often get a lot of attack from the media about. And, yeah. and yet it is a basic law that exists in the universe, that there are, you, you do have your other half, which is your soulmate, <laughs> yeah. and it might not be the husband or wife in, or the partner in which you're current, with which you're currently living. Yeah. I feel that um, Salyards highlights some of the reasons why um, the media gives us a hard time about this, of which course. is that, uh, that on earth men have claimed that certain of the opposite sex were their affinities in that people misuse this truth in order to fulfil their um, unloving desires. Yeah, we've heard many people, <coughs> of many people on, who think they're on the divine love path, I should say, who, who have basically gone from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship, saying that each time that, oh, he's my soulmate or she's my soulmate. And, uh, and the fact that they're going from one to the other to the other means they have no respect for the law at all. Because if they had a respect for the law of soulmates, they would not leave their current relationship in order to have a relationship with somebody else that they didn't know for certain was their soulmate. Mm -hmm. 
So, so it's only their desire to believe that that other person is their soulmate. And they're using this law of soulmates, if you like. They're using the, the fact that each one of us has been created with another half. They're using this fact as an excuse for badness, yeah. as an excuse for immoral behaviour. And many people we know have done this regularly over the time we've known them. Some of the people that we've known over the time we've known them, they've had four or five different relationships with four or five different people just over the time that you and I both together have known them. And, and for the ones that I've known, sometimes they've had 10 different relationships, yeah. uh, all claiming that each one was their soulmate at some point. And, and this uh, demonstrates a complete lack of respect for this law. And, and complete disregard for how we teach about this law as of well. Course. Because frankly, if you leave one relationship certain that this next person is your soulmate and within a couple of months you've you decided and you've <laughs> decided that certainly someone, then you're displaying a lack of integrity and ethics and a lack of desire to really know your own heart. And, and a lack of desire for your actual soulmate. Yes. So yeah. a lack of desire to actually have a relationship with your soulmate. Yeah. And you're just using the law that you've now learnt about, the law of soulmates, as an excuse for immoral behaviour, yeah. and that has its penalty, <laughs> as, as, <laughs> as we have discussed us, yes. <laughs> in this message. Yeah. <laughs> so um, another thing I thought is really important there to talk about is this concept of one of the opposite sex, who was his soulmate. Yeah. And obviously Paget had a lot of difficulties with the concept of, of homosexuality. And so he, it was impossible. He also had a lot of difficulties with a lot of other concepts. For example, he had a lot of difficulties with the concept that I had a soulmate. Well, this is, is what the I wanted why to bring he never up. channeled my soulmate. Yeah. Um, he also had a lot of difficulties with the with the concept of all of the men, Luke, Paul, Peter, all of the so-called apostles, all had soulmates that he could have spoken to, and yet he didn't. Yeah. And why didn't he? Well, because he didn't value them as individuals because he only valued the people that he knew of from the Bible record. And, uh, and this was a problem throughout all of his channeling is that he only valued the connections with people that he knew from the Bible record or that he understood from the Bible record. Or that he knew from on earth really. That's, that's correct. That's the majority of people that... Or that were friends of the people he knew on earth. Yes. You know, th yeah. There was all these connections that he had. Yeah. Uh, but he, he was unable to channel the soulmates of Luke, the soulmate of myself, the soulmate of Paul, the soulmate of Peter, and so forth. He was unable oh, to channel John. them because he had no desire, yeah. in fact, to channel them. And he also had no desire to know who was the soulmate of all of us. Mm -hmm. So he had no desire to know John's soulmate, for example. And John's soulmate was a male. And if he had channeled, who is your soulmate? And, and John attempted to write to him, oh, my soulmate's whoever it was at the time, yeah. I won't mention the name because John has to sort that out for himself and or I should say that person has to sort yeah, them yeah. out for himself because he's currently living on earth. And, you know, it, it, would, uh, it, it would be far better if, if, they, could, if they could see that, that all this information would have been channeled. But unfortunately, because Paget had this very, very strong belief inside of him that, you know, it was only male and female soulmates, he, he could not accept that the, what it meant any other way. So when Salyard's come to transmit the information to him, the only thing he could really get through was that one of the opposite sex was your soulmate. Mm. Now, it's one of it's a complementary relationship between soulmates. So it's not an opposite relationship. Yeah. It's a complementary relationship. It's not about sex or gender either. Mm -hmm. It's about the two halves of the soul splitting and then the two halves of the soul getting back together again, no matter who the two halves are and yeah. no matter what body they attracted. Now, obviously, if they're dominantly masculine, then they'll attract both male bodies. If they're dominantly feminine, they'll attract female bodies. And if they're, one's dominantly masculine, the other's dominantly feminine, expressions of the same soul, yeah. they will attract different bodies. So under those circumstances, when they're dominantly masculine and feminine, they'll attract different, different bodies, a male body and a female body. But it doesn't mean that they are opposites. They are complementary. They are the only complementary other half as well. They're yeah. the only person the that only fits. One. They're yeah. the only person that fits. Because it's the expression of the same soul, whether exactly. it be uh, a masculine, masculine expression, feminine, feminine expression, or masculine and feminine expression. Yeah. It is the one, the one soul, soul being expressed. Being expressed. Yeah. And, and this is the thing that uh, he found it difficult to get across to Paget because of Paget's belief systems. Yeah. 
Yeah. The thing that I wanted to mention there was the about um, the fact that a lot of people, even people who simply read the Paget messages, believe that you don't have a soulmate, and that clearly Salyards is saying it's a provision from our Father mm. of love and happiness, joy for that person. Why would he not provide? your soul with that provision why yeah, would you I just would, be a I would, complete I would soul? be complaining heavily if, <laughs> if, if, if it turned out that I was the only person who was ever created that had, didn't have a soulmate yeah. like I'd feel that's quite unfair right yeah and people <laughs> who get very attached to this idea I think have no so, like they're obviously invested for an emotional reason in your being asexual but um, and a lot of people on the planet are invested in that. Yeah, um, both men and women. Yeah, mm. but they have no real compassion, desire for your happiness. It's, it's, or and to even know what is the truth about my own soul, my own soul of which I am a half, they don't want to know the other half of its personality. Yeah. And for nearly 2,000 years, the majority of Christians have not wanted to know the other half of my soul. Yeah. Which yeah. means that they only know one half of me, actually. <laughs> and even then, they <laughs> and don't. Even then, not very well. Don't know that well. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I feel too. Um, there is this issue, I suppose, with this law, that basically what Salyards is saying is that is that God has created this beautiful law, and and He addresses one of the fears that most people have on the planet about this law, and that is. They want the person they're living with currently to be their soulmate, mm. whether they are their soulmate or not, mm -hmm. right? And then when they change, you know, partners, they want that person to be their soulmate and so forth. And there are deep emotional reasons why a person desires all of that rather than desiring to actually find their real soulmate. To know the truth. To know the truth. Mm. And I feel there is a lot of avoidance of this issue amongst people also that are listening to the divine truth. The fact is that the majority of women that we know who are listening to Divine Truth do not have a partner at all. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? Now, they say they're waiting for their soulmate, but, but I feel most of the time when I talk to them that they've got huge amounts of rage and anger about this whole concept of a soulmate. And they're so worried that somehow the soulmate, the other half of themselves, will take them over at some point control in the future or control or this, them or yeah. manipulate them or whatever it is that the majority of them don't even want to have a relationship of any kind except a relationship with another woman who is not their soulmate. Right? And, and an asexual and, and one. And an asexual yeah. one, you know, yeah. like a, not a, a friendship yeah. would be a better way of putting it. Yeah. And I feel so many people are avoiding this underlying truth. If you want to progress towards a one with God, by the time you hit the fifth dimension of the spirit world, so you're not even at one with God yet, you will probably know who your soulmate is and you will have to make decisions about that. <laughs> Right? If you want to progress further, you're going to have to make decisions about that. And if that means that the person you're currently with is not your soulmate, you're going to have to make some decisions about that. Yeah. Right? If you want to ever become at one with God, you'll have to make some decisions yeah. about that. You will be unable to live with anyone who is not your soulmate. And if you're unable to live with your soulmate as well, as he says there, there are some conditions in, in which you will be unable to live with your soulmate as well, yeah. then you'll have to live alone until such time as your soulmate wants to be with you. Yeah. And I feel a lot of people are avoiding that. A lot of people are avoiding this underlying feeling of, oh, but I'll be lonely and I'd rather have a relationship than none at all and all these other kinds of emotions that come up as a result of that kind of thinking. Yeah. And often I'm accused of, you know, just telling people that Mary Magdalene um, <laughs> in order to have sex with them. But I lived for five years without anybody in my life until I met you. And the reason why I did that was I didn't want to make a mistake again. I'd only made it twice before and I didn't want to make a mistake again of being with the person who wasn't my soulmate. Mm. And I was perfectly happy to live alone for a long period of time, even if it was much longer than that, I was perfectly happy to live alone, alone and wait for my soulmate to appear through the law of attraction and my work on my own soul. Yeah, people who accuse you of that, I, I have to laugh because they know nothing about y your nature and the level of integrity you have around this issue yeah. is very high. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I feel they're just... And I through a bitter experience of, of thinking that somebody was yeah. my soulmate acting upon and not really acting upon that because I, I knew that I was out of love with the person that I was with my wife at the time 
And I didn't get together straight away with the, per with the other person, but I, I acted upon a feeling that she was without me having cleared away all of my own impediments to realise who was my soulmate. And once I'd made that mistake, I didn't want to make that mistake again. Yeah. And so that's why I was very circumspect after that. People would tell me, oh, I'm your soulmate, or they'd tell me like such and such a soulmate. I might go and check it out. You know, when I say go and check it out, I'd meet the person and say hello to them and, and see what, what I could feel from their personality and their character. But I would never engage a relationship with them after that because, it, because to me, it was not right to engage a relationship that was out of harmony with this soulmate relationship. And so once I realised soulmates was a truth, once I realised that from that moment on, I decided not to ever, and I, and I no longer either engaged the relationship with the person I thought was my soulmate until I knew for certain. And, and, and once, after a few years, I knew for certain she wasn't. And so that was great, that, that it helped me work through all of those issues. Yeah. And I feel that for the majority of people on earth, those both in partnerships and out of partnerships, they do not want to work through this issue. And quite often we have conversations with people where they say, oh, yeah, I know the soulmate's around, but I don't want to really you know, know who it is. Yeah. Uh, because, and what are they really saying? They're really saying is they don't want to grow to at one moment with God. They also well, don't, don't want to grow... The other, the, half, of the other half of themselves. They yeah. don't want to grow to it one with the other half of themselves. That's what they're saying. Yeah, and I've heard people say terrible things about their, oh, I don't want to meet my soulmate. He's probably not even spiritual. What if I can't even talk to God about it? And I have to or object strongly. I know who strongly. my soulmate is and I don't like him. Or... Yeah, and that's a huge judgment of God, what God has created for us. Yeah. Of a misunderstanding of how errors enter the soul. Exactly, and yep. that we are created pristine, and we can return to that yep. to that position. But also, there's a fair few planks in eyes that are, you know, totally people also judging what I see as loving in someone who they believe is their soulmate as an unloving thing because that doesn't meet their addictions. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah and so there's I feel huge issues of growth in this area. I feel that people are neglecting as well. I, if you just look at the planet and the injuries that we have sexually and that the vast majority or the majority of soulmates are um, of opposite genders, yeah. the intergender injuries that are on the planet, yeah. if we choose to engage those those injuries. wounds within us... We'd soon find out. We would find out, but we also grow immensely mm -hmm. in the process. Towards God. Towards God, yeah. If And, and I feel uh, many people who say, ah, oh, you know, I know there's a soulmate issue, but I don't know if I really want to resolve that issue. Really what they're saying is their desire to be at one with God is not very strong at all. And their desire to know themselves is not very strong at all. And if you like, their desire to honour this law is also not very strong. I have exactly. had conversations with people who say, yeah, I'm with this person and I don't believe that they're my soulmate. And while I never... So why are you with them then, uh, if yeah. you honoured the law? Well, that's right. Mm. I, don't, I don't then say, well, why are you with them then? But I, well, I would. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> You're much more up front. Well, you, if you know they're not your soulmate, um, why are you with them? If you know for certain they're not your soulmate, why are you with them? Exactly. It makes no sense at all for your future life. Or the future life of the person you're with. Or their future with. life, yeah. 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 But, and their soulmate's future life. You, you're preventing their soulmate from being with them there's as well. There's quite a lot of people you're affecting. In yeah, that, uh, and of course there's going to be law of compensation effects on those particular events too. Yeah. If you know for certain someone's not your soulmate and yet you're still with them, yeah. you've got to consider why you're with them. There's obviously huge addictions in play yeah. to be with with this person yeah. if you're with a person who you know for certain is not, not your soulmate. And I suppose that was the, the final thing that I wanted to say about this law is that um, Salyud says it doesn't mean, it's not a fact that when you're on earth, the person that you have as your husband or your wife is going to be your soulmate. Mm. And I that's because God created soulmate relationship to be very pure and mm. loving. And, and you'll only really find out who your soulmate is if you're willing to become pure and loving. Exactly. So these people who often are still acting out of harmony, love and a lot of errors and then say, I know for certain who my soulmate is, I go, I, I, I doubt that very much because, <laughs> because you are often acting out of harmony with love yourself and particularly with the way in which you handle opposite 
gender, gender interactions, yeah. you know, sometimes they sexually project at them or flirt with them or whatever. This is proof that you're not resolving these particular issues. So you can't say for certain that such and such is your soulmate while you have all of these emotional injuries because it, it's only the purity of your soul that you start gaining through your progress towards God that you end up with knowing for certain who your soulmate actually is. Yeah. It's not by going, oh, uh, you know, some spirit comes along and tells you, oh, that's your soulmate. And you go, oh, yeah, that's who I know my soulmate is. That's not the way to know who your soulmate is. And it's certainly not the way to engage a loving relationship with your soulmate. No. E even if that person is your soulmate, there's a lot. There's a there's a reason why you didn't know that yourself. Exactly. Uh, and there's also this issue too of even if that person is your soulmate, you may not be able to be with them. They may have all sorts of stuff going on for themselves that you may not be able to engage if you love yourself and if you love them, mm -hmm. and that you may have to be patiently waiting by yourself. And there's plenty of celestial spirits who are patiently waiting by themselves and to, for their other half of themselves to come to acknowledgement and recognition. And also, no celestial spirit generally goes and, go, goes and tells the person they're their soulmate without first engaging some kind of a friendship or some kind of other uh, consideration in the process. They don't just go and berate the person. And mm -hmm. we see, we get many emails from women in particular saying, oh, I went and told him, I was, I'm your soulmate. And, and, and that's God's plan. And I should uh, tell him and yeah, there you go. And, he, and yet he <laughs> reacted really badly. And I go, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I can see why he reacted very badly because you were very unloving actually. <laughs> And you've just tried to interrupt the entire life. And, you and also, some but, of them are in relationships. Yeah, some of them are in unethical. relationships. And, but yeah. also others of them were are just, the women are just being so demanding that the person begins a relationship with them. What? You know, like, <laughs> like that is indication that your condition, if you're a demanding woman doing this with another per, with a, or with a, a soulmate. Or a man. Or a man, I for that know matter. men have done We've known a few well. men yeah. have done it, but mostly women who have done it so far. And if you're one of these people that have done this, then you are demonstrating your lack of condition. Mm. Why would he want or she want to be with you <laughs> under those circumstances? You'd, you'd wonder, you'd, you'd understand completely why he'd run 100 miles in the other direction, even if you are his soulmate. Yeah. And, and I feel quite often that the people who do this have no idea whether that person is their soulmate or not. They are just basing it around spirit influence and other decisions because they themselves have not yet personally reached their point in their own development where they would attract their own soulmate. Yeah. <coughs> we talked uh, yesterday, wasn't it, to uh, Rosemary, a, spirit, yes. yeah. uh, a Christian spirit lady who was a Lutheran while I was on, on earth. She's a grandma who passed into the spirit world. And uh, she was in the four sphere and she's not yet met her soulmate and she's about to meet her soulmate. She can feel that she's having a strong desire to meet him now. And, you know, it is potentially likely that he might be in the hells or it might be somewhere else and they might not be able to have a relationship for many years to come. Yeah. And, and she will engage this relationship in a loving way, not, not well, in this demanding, yes. bossy, manipulative way that most people seem to want to engage it. She, you could feel in her condition that she, she felt it was an honour to meet her soulmate wherever he might be, mm. and it was an excitement in her, and yeah. and still this independent or, um, of his condition. Exactly this this discovery, like a childlike discovery yeah. of of this other relationship, this other part of her, this next step on her journey to God, and. Yeah. I feel if we honoured this law that Sally is talking about, this is the attitude that we would have. Exactly. We would see it as a provision of God, as he mentions, rather than seeing it as a chore. Or, or I remember the first time we discussed soulmate <laughs> issues and you were quite angry with God at the time and swearing and carrying on towards God about having had a soulmate. And, and that is a demonstration of, how, of the injuries that cause us to not honour the law. Yeah, yeah, many and many women, I, I, we have this and men too, fear of being controlled, this feeling that there's no choice, I must have choice. And, yeah. and, and many men have this viewpoint of wanting to play the field, you know, um, you, know, that, you know, there's this common viewpoint on earth that that's what men are like, yeah. you know, that there's no such thing as fidelity in a man, yeah. which is yeah. completely, it demonstrates how little they're connected with the soulmate part of themselves if they feel that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is why I laugh when people say that you just tell people they're Mary Magdalene to sleep with them, because, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Because you, you uh, there's so much fidelity in you um, towards 
me, but also the law of soulmates, you know, and you, yeah. you won't break that law even with me. And, and I won't even sleep with you under certain conditions. Yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. not like... Uh, that's what I mean. Like, it's certainly not, uh, as you just said, when we first met, there was a lot of other feelings in me. So it wasn't a sure thing by any means. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> So, but I feel that these, these laws that uh, that we've discussed in these messages have been have, are good to discuss because these are basic spiritual laws that, if you look at them sincerely, a lot of people who believe they are following the path of divine love are still pretty much ignoring. Yeah. And if and also if we look at them sincerely, we can see that if we followed them sincerely, a lot of emotions would come up and we'd work through a lot of things and therefore purify our love as a result. This concept, if we honour the law above our emotions, then our emotional healing takes place. Exactly. It's when we focus on our emotions and above try the to law. D deny the law or just pay or ignore the inter law. intellectual lip service to the law. This was our discussion this morning that yeah. we referred to earlier where yeah. I had gone, yeah, yeah, my intellect's not disagreeing with you, but suddenly my emotions are challenged. So you and I had had many discussions about the law of free will, for example, yeah. But you were still valuing your fear above the, fear, the law of free will, yeah. which meant that you couldn't feel your fear because yes. you were living in it. Yeah. Whereas if you now value the law of free will above your fear, then every time your fear comes up, you're going to have to engage the law of free will properly every yeah. time, and that will cause your fear to come out. Yes. And so this is what I feel a lot of people don't understand about all these laws. The more of them we understand, we can engage them and as we engage them and honour them, we honour them as God's laws. Yeah. Once we understand them and we, we believe them to be God's laws, we honour them as God's laws. Once we honour them as God's laws, the subsequent result is the emotional processing will just happen. The healing. Yeah. The healing will just happen. And this is where I feel um, f for yourself as a teacher, people do not understand the... Um, the fidelity you have to all of these laws. Mm. You you learn a law, you know it, and because of your honour of God and your honour of the way God has designed the universe, yeah. which is based on these laws, then you honour the laws and your emotional healing happens as a result. Whereas I see a lot of people attracted to us or Listening periodically are coming in and out of our life yeah. or dabbling yeah. in listening to what we teach who focus so strongly on the emotions. Yeah. Uh, Without any consideration of the law of we, love. No. We like the sound of the law of love, but when we live in fear... But even fear, when they're feeling their emotions, they're often out of harmony with the law of love. It, they're it, trying to impose it upon another person and have the other person share in their emotion and share their experience. That's all unloving behaviour, of which there is a consequence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so yes. they think they're clearing something while they're creating a whole heap of other things. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's a very facade-based kind of interaction with what the, the depth of what it is we're presenting, I yeah. feel. Yeah. So I, I feel if we learn to have integrity to the laws, that even just the ones that Joseph has mentioned in these two uh, channelings that Paget did, if we had integrity to those particular laws we would find the subsequent result would be that we'd be acting in more harmony with love and sometimes we'd be very terrified to do it. Like there are times in my own life where I feel quite terrified. I know what the law is telling me to do and I also can feel inside of me, I, I'm not sure I want to do that because I can feel what might be the potential outcome but I still engage the law. So mm -hmm. people say to me oh, that I talk to them about their emotions for other reasons but I don't. I talk to them about their emotions because... The law demands this of me, yeah. even if I'm afraid to do so. Yeah. If I know the truth, and I know the truth will relieve a person of their of their unhappiness, and, and I don't this, share it, yeah. I am breaking a law. Yeah. And, and, and so to me, uh, there's this integrity that I have to have to the law, even though I might be afraid to say to somebody, oh, do you realise that you just... You know, they're sitting with their wife and I just say to them, oh, you realise that you're now sexually projecting that woman over there. You know, like, um, you know, that that could cause a whole heap of problems in the mo moment. Um, but, but I can't think of that, it feels to me. I've just got to feel my fear about that, but still engage the law, the yeah. law that I must disclose the truth that I, that I know for certain is true, yeah. for example. And so I feel that if people do that with these channelings, these two channelings, it will benefit them immensely. If people ignore these laws, that are just these basic laws that Joseph Salias has listed, and ignore attempting to embrace them, then of course 
there are going to be consequences to that. Yeah. And also, you, you can't really claim that you're following the principles of divine truth either. Yeah. yeah. So we'd like to thank you for your time today in uh, discussing this, uh, these messages from Joseph Sellers. Um, we're not sure what the next message will be from the pageant messages. We have quite a few hundred of them lined up <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it just depends at the time as to uh, what we feel is important to discuss. But there are so many important messages that we would love to discuss that we, that we read fairly constantly and, and uh, we'd love to share with you at some point in the future. But thank you for your time today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>